Signore e signori, buonasera. buonasera. Bentornati. Welcome back home. Bentornati a casa. As you know, Fred Plotkin and his adventures in Italian opera are the most established series here at Casa Italiana. I would say the most beloved one. Which edition is this, Fred? I lost count. There was something in between, right? In this 11th year, a gap that we would like to forget, but it's there. And it's a great, great pleasure to welcome back Fred and his guests, of course, uh, to the Casa for this very beloved series. As you know, most of the uh, conversations of Fred with the great protagonists of opera today, uh, you can find them either on the website of Casa Italiana or on Vimeo. Just look for Adventures in Italian Opera with Fred Plotkin and you'll find the whole thing. I always say that it's like an extended university course in opera that is at the disposal of everybody. And you name it, they were here in these chairs to talk with friends. Singers, uh, directors, conductors, um, general managers of opera houses, uh, journalists that uh, write about opera. Just about all the protagonists, he was able to bring them here to have them in this very intimate contest of our uh, auditorium. And it's a great, great pleasure for us to welcome Fred back. It's impossible for me to tell you uh, every time uh, Fred's uh, biography and bibliography, because also because I see many familiar faces, you, you know them. You find his bio anyway uh, updated on the website of the Casa. I just want to add something. During this gap that preceded this return, uh, Fred uh, started a collaboration with Idagio, that is a channel dedicated to Musica. And it's like Adagio, but spelled with the final, with the I at the beginning instead of an A, so Idagio. And you can find it on your computer, idagio.com. And yes, as a series, every Friday, he meets a protagonist of opera. So while we were not able to have him here, he continued on the wavelength of a radio internet program. And again, you find all the previous conversations of Fred on the Idagio channel. One very important thing. On top of the conversations, Fred is about to start a course, structured like a real university course, on Idagio, so idagio.com, on Giuseppe Verdi, that as you know is one of his great loves. And uh, if you're interested in following the course, you can go on idagio.com, again, spelled like adagio, but with I at the beginning, instead of A, and find all the information you need. And as always, I want to leave the pleasure to introduce his guest to Fred, but I'm asking you to welcome both Fred Plotkin and Michele Pertusi. Thank you. So one of the questions I'm most asked is, does Fred still have his mustache? <laughs> I do. Um, how have you been? Wonderful to see everyone here again, and also those of you watching at home all over the world. Um, Adagio is different from Fred Plotkin here, because this is Adventures in Italian Opera, but with Adagio, I've covered German, Russian, all kinds of other things, but this is the Casa Italiana, e qui si fa opera italiana. And so, therefore, my first three guests for this season, tonight and the next two, on November 14th and November 21st, I wanted real Italians. And we have Un Vero Italiano Stasera, Michele Pertuzzi, the bass from Parma. The next two will be conductors, November 14th, Carlo Rizzi, and November 21st, Speranza Scapucci making her Met debut, finally conducting Rigoletto at the Met. But I wanted to begin, I think, you know, if you want to do Italian opera right, you always think of Parma. And we have a wonderful Parmigiano singer who is Parmigiano Doc, and I want to talk to him tonight about growing up in Parma and how you experience opera and music and the whole culture that is Italian opera when you live in one of the real world capitals of opera that also has very good food, to put it mildly. So would you please welcome Michele Pertuzzi. <laughs> and 
And I also want you to know that our wonderful Julian is in the controls tonight. And Julian, I think when you have a moment, I would like to start with selection number 10. Tutto Michele Pertusi stasera. Michele Pertusi Festival. That's right. <laughs> so this we're just going to listen. Su immensi candori piove uno sciame nieve, forse cercano i fiori le farfalle di neve. Noi siamo i fiori belli, siamo le fiorenti ai capelli o oh farfalle venite o oh farfalle So did you think I was going to start with music of Giuseppe Verdi? <laughs> no, it's not Verdi, it's Tosti. It's Tosti. Right. I thought that to relight our lights here, that it would be best to start with the human voice, because that's at the core of what opera is, more than the scenery, more than the lighting, more than the critics, more than the libretto, more than everything. The really the foundation of what we love is the human voice. Michele has a beautiful voice that you use beautifully. Thank you. I, I try to you, sing well. So far, you're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it would be interesting to start with music that you may not know. Tolsti is a composer. You talk about Tolsti. What do you like about Tolsti? I like uh, very much Tosti because he's a, a composer that uh, give, uh, give, gives an, uh, uh, an, an imagine of, of Italian music, Italian chamber music. Mm -hmm. uh, he, Tosti is our, is our Schubert, is our Schumann. Mm. Uh, in Germany, we have different the text and the music too, but uh, for us, uh, is the Tosti, the, for example, Tosti, Denza, the, the Neapolitan song also mm -hmm. um, in Italy are the conjunction with with uh, uh, opera music or classic music and the uh, rock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was the first uh, example of rock in Italy mm -hmm. yeah. of popular music. Yeah, popular yeah. music, pop music. Yeah. yeah, and in this case, and and this recording, you. We have the text by Gabriele D'Annunzio, yes. the Italian poet. Uh, and he's the one who said about Verdi that he loved and cried for all of us. Yeah. When you go to Verdi's tomb in Milan, uh, Amo e pianse per tutti. Diede speranze alle miserie e ai lutti. Yeah. Pianse ed amò per tutti. Yeah. È una grande, 
And a great, great phrase. Great, great to describe phrase. Verdi. Um, so if you grew up in Parma, where in Parma did you grow up? Let's get precise. Parma. But dove a Parma? Because dove come? In what part of Parma? Ah, um, oltre torrente, the, the, the uh, city. Okay. Oltre torrente, so on the other side of the river. Sì. So the how near the house of Toscanini. Yes, absolutely. Yes, okay. So imagine that you are growing up, that you're born, and you're told that Parma is the world capital of opera. And even though other places may claim that, but Parma will tell you it's that, because over there is the Teatro Reggio, and they do Verdi, and they do all of that, and Verdi was from the province of Parma. And right here, close to where you live, is the home of Arturo Toscanini, still the most famous conductor of all time, even though he died more than 60 years ago. So when you were a boy, and did people talk about Toscanini, who was from near there, did you, were you aware of that as a child? For me, Toscanini, I, I discovered Toscanini uh, uh, a little bit late, mm -hmm. not not uh, when was a, when was a boy. Yeah. A boy. I I start to to listen to the American recordings uh, uh -huh. of Toscanini about uh, fourteen years old. Mm -hmm. uh, but before, uh, for me, the music the, was the voice, the great singers, Tebaldi, Bergonzi, mm -hmm. Siepi, Bastianini, because uh, I, I, come from, I come from a family, very musical. Mm -hmm. Everybody in my family s sang and sang very well. Um, a sister of my my paternal father, grandfather mm -hmm. was uh, uh, was in the in the same uh, in the same class of Renata Tebaldi in the conservatory. Uh -huh. uh, she she stops she st stopped uh, her for to study because uh, in, in 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 this period after. After the the war, or, or, or in, in the in the year of the war, mm -hmm. the second war, uh, was very difficult to to study because, uh, and she she married very young, mm -hmm. and unfortunately also dead very young. Ah. Uh, but my 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 paternal grandfather was a little baritone, uh -huh. but. Uh, in, uh, uh, for example, uh, was a barber. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> was a Figaro, was, was a Figaro. A <laughs> uh, um, cl client of my, my grandfather was mm -hmm. uh, De Brando Pizzetti, for example. Uh -huh, okay. Was the first Composer. house band of yeah. uh, Anna Moffo, Mario Lanfranchi, was a yeah. producer, was a yeah. client of my, my grandfather. Yeah. Uh, maestro, um, this, Maestro P uh, Pizzetti e Martini mm -hmm. was a was a teacher mm -hmm. was a teacher of the uh, many 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 singer in, in the in this period. Uh, my 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 uh, maternal grandfather was a uh, a very profondo basso profondo e mm -hmm. uh, in, in my family, uh, the opera was uh, the life. Yeah. Uh, I was born in this. My another another um, brother of my my grandfather was the the makeup uh, uh -huh. makeup artist in the yeah. Teatro Reggio. Uh, and that's really the point I'm making. That if you grow up in Parma. You are connected to the theater and to the opera tradition, and then there are families for whom it is their tradition. My father too was a little, little uh, tenore leggero. Yeah, uh, I had uh, my uh, my um, a nonna, come si dice? Grandmother, grandmother, grandmother. Yeah. Uh, maternal grandmother. Mm -hmm. I had two sisters in the chorus of the Teatro Reggio. Ah. 
My family was... Uh, yeah. I, I, I born in the music. Yeah. In the opera music. Did you ever meet Renata Tabaldi? I know Renata Tabaldi very well. I'm, Would you talk uh, about her? For I mean, we had a pandemic, as you know, so certain things got lost. Her birthday was February 1st, 1922, yeah. so that... There would have been a big anniversary celebration a few months ago. No, she's not living. But um, but there is a Renata Tibaldi Museum in Busetto, and, and she's a legend in that part of Italy, everywhere, but in that part of Italy. Talk when about I, Renata Tibaldi. When, when, when I met, every time when I met Renata Tibaldi, uh, for example, in the Torrecchiara Festival, mm -hmm. it was a little, little festival, little festival, uh, not so far from Langirano, the mm -hmm. Tebaldi was uh, ham. Langirano. Langirano ham. Yeah, Langirano <laughs> ham. Uh, every time I met uh, Renata in the festival, they they speak me in in Parmesan dialect. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know why. Yeah, <laughs> I see me. Ah, ciao Michele. Eh, she speaks uh, the, 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 mm -hmm. the, the Parmesan dialect. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's, 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 it's funny. Was she open? Was she private? Was she calorosa? Was she a bit no, with, reserved? With me, with me uh, really like, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, uh, calorosa. Yeah, uh, warm. Warm. Yeah. Warm and... Uh, like uh, una zia, una vecchia zia. Like an old aunt. <laughs> <laughs> I asked because her nickname, and I forget how they said this in Italian, you can tell me, was Dimples of Steel. In other words, she had a smile, and the dimples were locked Fossette. into... Fossette. Fossette di, di yeah. acciaio. Um, because you could see a lot of pictures of her, and she had this sort of firm yeah. smile. It was a smile, but it was steel right there. And she, I only met her a couple of times. I didn't know her really well. But I found her very correct, very professional. One thing that struck me about Renata Tibaldi is that, she, remember, she was in the province of Parma. She had very little interest in food. She basically ate the same dish every day, which was chicken breast cooked with rosemary. And that was it. And occasionally asparagus, very little pasta. She just, I mean, and she was not heavy, but she was strong. And, but somehow that was what she ate every single day. <laughs> Petto di polo <laughs> con rosmarino. Every day? Practically every day. <laughs> and when you read her memoir, which I read, um, she wrote in great detail about eating chicken with rosemary because, you know, it was before the performance, another chicken breast with rosemary. And I don't know, Luciano Pavarotti did not stick to chicken with rosemary. <laughs> um, but I'm saying this to our audience at home and here. It is a remarkable thing when you go to Parma and Emilia Romagna in general how many people live opera in a way that you don't find even in much of Italy? Yes, we had in Emilia Romagna, we had also <clears throat> the, small, the small town mm -hmm. with a beautiful a beautiful opera house, Budrio, yeah. uh, Carpi, mm -hmm. uh, many, many small, small, Estate, small town. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, is now the problem is uh, like usual is the the money mm -hmm. but uh, it will be in interesting to to give opera also in this uh, in this in this small theater mm -hmm. because it's, it's very interesting it's, the tradition is uh, very present yeah i think the audience the, the people uh, want to to have uh, again uh, go to the opera mm -hmm. um also, we have uh, Piacenza, Parma, Modena, Reggio Emilia, Bologna is a very important, very important mm -hmm. opera house. Ferrara, uh, Ferrara Ravenna, Ravenna also with the yeah. festival. Yeah. For Lee, for Lee was the, f f uh, the first of Aroldo, mm -hmm. uh, was in Forlì. Yeah. Uh, Forlì is a small-ish town 
between Bologna and Rimini, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And also um, Cesena, yeah. uh, Teatro Bonci, mm -hmm. uh, was a great tenor. Alessandro Bonci was, yeah. uh, was born in Cesena. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's and also Emilia Romagna El Marche. Yeah. We have the small, small, small town with a beautiful mm -hmm. theater, Cagli, mm -hmm. uh, Mondolfo. Mm -hmm. Mondolfo, so, Mondolfo, Beniamino Gigli, Sangaida, I yeah. think. Just to continue on our map, Marche is the region. There's uh, San Leo, there are these little towns there, and then Pesaro, where Rossini was from. Um, Rossini was born in the Marche. Um, Franco Corelli was born there, and Tobaldi was born in the Marche. Mm, she grew up in Langhirano, which is, I was saying ham, I really meant that. Prosciutto di Parma is really prosciutto from Langhirano. <laughs> it's not from the city of Parma, it's from Langhirano. And there's a nearby town called Felino, like feline, like cat. And that's where the good Parma salami comes from. It's made of pig, not of cat. And, um, but the thing is, you could be, you can go in this region and every town is steeped in culture in a way that is just something remarkable. There's a little town called Zibello, and Zibello is not too far from where Verdi grew up in Sant'Agata, where he had his farm. Do you want to talk about Sant'Agata a bit tonight? Yeah. We have a problem. Now I think it's Sant important. Um, anyway, Zibello, terrific food, great tradition. I go to Zibello to discover the food that Verdi ate because it's closest to the La Cucina di Verdi is what's served in Zibello. Sant'Agata Sant is on sale now. Is on sale. Verdi, Giuseppe Verdi's home has, it's a long legal story, but it's been put up for sale. And the fact that the Italian state mm. does not acquire it and make it a national shrine to me is something unbelievable. But um, it is his papers, his everything could go. Um, I recently was looking in one of my closets and found a jar of honey. And they used to produce honey there made by bees that fed on the trees that were planted by Giuseppe Verdi. You cannot destroy this property. I hope, uh, I hope the Italian state uh, can to, to buy because uh, I think it would be a pity to, to have uh, the Verdi house in, uh, in private hands. It's just, it's just unacceptable. I'm saying this publicly because people watch here, but I mean, any Italian foundation, corporation, whatever, that would think to buy and save Verdi's house would be doing a benefit for all people who love opera, but also this is the man who helped create Italy, the Italian Republic, so it's, it just, you know, would you knock down George Washington's house? No, yeah. it's the same thing. It's really the same yeah. thing. But anyway, since we're talking about that, I had to bring it up. But because also Verdi represent uh, uh, l'emblema del It's the emblem, yeah. the emblem of the Italian, because was uh, was a farmer, mm -hmm. was a patriot. Maybe rep I don't know, but. It's okay. In the, the, in the first part of his career, he was a patriot. Yeah. Where he was also, um, was also a um, benefactor. Mm -hmm. Was a businessman. Was a musician. Was a an agronomist. Uh, he brought many plants to Italy that had never been in Italy before. Was a politician. Yeah. Uh, in uh, in uh, in this way. Uh, and, Verdi, uh, is in, in one person, is the figure of the Italian uh, in the in the in the in the Italian in in this period, mm -hmm. very difficult period. Yeah, uh, I think it's very is, is so important for the for for the Italia like a country, mm -hmm. a political country, yeah. and uh, and also the um, for to like a, a, a glue for the language mm -hmm. Italian, because in, in this period was uh, the, the language was was uh, represented in the opera 
not in the poetry or in the in the dramaturgy mm -hmm. was in the opera the the italian language born in the opera i often say when i teach and by the way julian would you set up number four um that there were three figures of 19th century italy who in many ways made the italy we have it's verdi it was the writer Alessandro Manzoni who wrote the novel Promessi Sposi that sort of formed the modern Italian language. And Pellegrino Artusi, who was my other hero, this is a man who went from house to house to house visiting women and asking them what they were cooking and writing down their recipes. And what he did was he unified Italy gastronomically because before that Italy was regions, provinces, and so on many under foreign occupation. But when Artusi went around and created this book called The Art and Science of the Kitchen, what he did was he said, this is Italy. So music from Verdi and politics, language from Manzoni, and identity through food from Pellegrino Artusi. So Julian, if you're ready, please play number four. Okay, so let me slow scare. Mentre gonfiarsi l'anima Parea dinanzi a Roma Ma parve in mano un veglio Che ma ferrò Il senso è più travolto, la mancia lo sbranto, e il sorriso in volto, e cari fecco manto.
concert was uh, yeah. my friend uh, Luca Salsi is, is here tonight. We know that in, Luca in, Salsi is in, here tonight. <laughs> in, uh, in Venice. Uh, Wonder, dove se Luca? In the back. Wonderful baritone <laughs> coming to the Met this season. Bentornato. Um, I selected this particular selection from Verdi's Attila because I think it's one of his least appreciated operas that really merits rediscovery. It's a wonderful role for bass. This was, was that in Teatro La Fenice? Yeah. So this was Teatro La Fenice where it premiered in 1846. Yeah. And the story behind this opera is not only the story of Attila the Hun, which is to say Austrians, people outside invaders coming in and taking um, part of northeastern Italy, but it's a story of the Venetians, and it's the story of Verdi trying to inspire the Venetians to rise up against the Austrians, 1846. What happened in 1846 was, if you've been to Venice, you know there's a railway bridge that goes from the mainland into the old quarter of Venice, the Centro Storico, and they built a train station there. They destroyed part of old Venice. And to the Venetians, this was a terrible affront that, number one, a bridge, they were being connected. They were an island republic. They were La Serenissima. And now they're just the end of a railway line, beginning in Vienna and ending in Venice. So Verdi tried to awaken in the Venetians the sense that they were under attack by taking Attila the Hun, in other words, Austria, northern Europeans, attacking Aquileia, which was the ancient story. And Aquileia, if you know your Friulian history, was the mother of Venice. When Aquileia was destroyed, the people moved to these islands in the northern Adriatic and rose like a, fin a, a phoenix, a fenice. Aquileia rose again as Venice. So it was deeply, deeply connected in the mentality of Italians, especially Venetians. And therefore, this story, it's a wonderful opera. Um, and people now think of it just as Attila the Hun. But this was Verdi the Patriot. This was Verdi saying, rise up against your foreign occupiers. And it was, we know about Nabucco and other operas before that. This is another one that really made Italians stand up. The most famous line to me in all of Verdi, which will be on my tombstone, is from this opera. It's said by Ezio, Avrai tu l'universo, resti l'Italia me. You can have the universe, let Italy be mine. And that became the national cry of the people from Attila. So talk about this opera, Attila, that you have performed. I love, I love Attila. I sang um, not so not so many times, but I sang in uh, Bologna first time in 1999. Mm -hmm. I sang also in uh, uh, Parma. The last time was Parma in Venice mm -hmm. in 2004. The last opera in the in the um, 
the Fenice was was, was, was not open down, in the yeah. yeah yeah like like a circus in the right. <laughs> Uh, was the, I, I sang the first opera and the last opera in the circus in, <laughs> <laughs> in Venice. Um, I sang also in Liegi, mm-hmm. until in Liegi in, in uh, Belgium, Belgium, in uh, Liege mm-hmm. for the Verdi celebration in uh, 2013. One, 13, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, it's okay. For mm-hmm. me, it's a very interesting uh, character. Very difficult uh, because the require a, 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 a voice, important voice, but is very high. Yeah, the tessitura, the for a bass. Yes, yeah. for a, for a bass is very high, like like a little bit Lombardi. Mm-hmm. Lombardi la prima crociata Nabucco. Mm-hmm. The first verse is always uh, high. Why is that? Uh, because uh, the tra- it was a little bit the tradition uh, of uh, Rossini and Donizetti, f- uh, because it, it, Verdi, Verdi was the first uh, composer in, the, in, in this period that uh, uh, invent or, 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 or discipline the, the, the voice of the baritone. Mm-hmm. And in, for example, in Lombardia la prima crociata is not baritone. Mm-hmm. But the bass is very high yeah. because uh, it replace a little bit the baritone. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Attila is the Ezio, for example. I think is the um, the part of baritone more more high. Yeah. In 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 the Verdi production, I think mm-hmm. because is the tessitura is uh, very very high. E Attila for to 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 go against ex- Ezio is mm-hmm. high too. Uh, the tenor, the tenor, and uh, in Attila also is high bec- the writing is high because the use of the tonality yeah. in Verdi uh, require require high tessitura. Mm-hmm. Uh, is a is a little bit mystery. Yeah, but uh, the the color of the of the dramaturgical moment is 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 right. It's very because beautiful. Later with Simone Bocanegra and Don Carlo. Then yes. everything got lower. Not in the extreme. Yeah. Because also also, Filippo, also, Filippo, yeah. also Filippo also Filippo also mm-hmm. Filippo is high. Yeah. Uh, but the the writing is a little bit more less uh, less high. Mm-hmm. What is the lowest Verdi role you have sung? Uh, but Filippo Fucile. Yeah. Fucile. But. Uh, I think uh, this the, is, is the Inquisitor, no? the, the more yeah, the Grand Inquisitor in Don Carlo. Uh, because it, because he's high, he's very yeah. high. But one moment, yeah, <laughs> so it's a, it's a e, e natural for a, you should feel that from close. So dinanzi al re, yeah. Uh, in Verdi, I think is in, don't exist uh, mm-hmm. the basso profondo because also also Padre Guardiano, yes, in La Forza del Destino, Forza del Destino yeah. is a F, yeah. low F, okay, but it's very high. Yeah. Uh, so would deeper bassi profondi be in Rossini? Rossini, not, no. not in Semiramide, not no. in Maometto II. Yeah. Uh, Mustafa? Mustafa, no. It's no. very high also. May, no, maybe, maybe La Pietra del Paragone. Or, yeah. or the priest in uh, Assedio di Corinto. Yes. It's a profound We're going to talk about Corinth, Corinto yeah. later, yeah. when we get to Medea, which is... Ah. By the way, Michele, in case I, Medea, I, I don't know, because it's <laughs> Michele is right I, now <laughs> appearing at the Metropolitan Opera in a magnificent performance. He's King Creon. It's his palace. It's set in, and um, we'll talk about that a bit later. But it's really stupendous. I've been the twice. Pro- the production is beautiful. The yeah. production is beautiful, and the performers are magnificent. Are you sure? All of you. Oh. Almost all of you. Almost all of you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really, it's one of the, well, let's talk about okay. it now then. No, it's okay. It's okay. And in the meantime, Julian, set up number one. 
Um, I've been asked, as you can imagine, very, very often, what opera that the Met has never done should the Met do and do you, would you want to see? And my answer for the past 35 years, maybe 40, has been Carabina's Medea, or Medea in French as it was originally written. It's a fabulous opera, and the Met just never did it. Uh, people say because, well, the story is it was born in Paris in 1797. Cherubini was an Italian, of course, and it was written in French. It was not a success originally. Um, it was done intermittently. It's based on the story of Medea by Euripides, but also by, I'm forgetting, Racine or Corneille, I think Corneille. Um, so French drama as well. And the character Medea has killed her father, has killed her brother, and cut him up into many little pieces. Um, she kills her children. She kills her husband's wife-to-be. She's a serial killer. <laughs> but to me, she's multi sympathetic. I like A her. good girl. It was, it was a good girl. And I mean, I, she's angry. And, and I mean, in ancient Greece, you responded by basically, she's a, something of a sorceress. If you don't like what they're doing, and I don't, I'm not supporting killing people, obviously, but in the character of the opera, um, she's killed a lot of people, but she, people have treated her badly. And this is her response. And her ultimate hysterical, insane response when she's angry at her husband is to kill their children. But that almost happens in Norma, too. So in many ways, Carabina's Medea from 1797 set the template for these women who kill in opera in the 19th century, or almost kill. Norma almost kills. Lucia di Lammermoor kills. A lot of them kill. And I'm not, again, I'm not supporting this in life. <laughs> but really, the character that is the foundation of much that followed in 19th century opera was Medea. And Cherubini did things in his orchestra that Beethoven and Rossini copied, and then everybody copied Beethoven and Rossini. But it began with Cherubini. And here is this one work from the very end of the 19th century, written in France at the time of the French Revolution, that was an amazing work that had the French Revolution and all that followed not been going on, I think would have taken its place in the repertory. But Rossini lived in Paris for a long time. Donizetti, Bellini went to Paris. Verdi was in Paris. They all knew Medea. And I think that Medea is the work that we have to look at to really understand what happened with 19th century Italian opera. And the Met never did it. Um, it was ultimately translated by Zangarini, I think his name is, a movie director in early Italian cinema, into Italian and became Medea. And Maria Callas did it in the 1950s in places like Dallas and Milan, but not New York. And it became legendary, and there are recordings of Kalas doing this, and she was extraordinary. She was Greek. She got it. And so, therefore, people said, after Kalas, you can't do it. But my belief is, if you have the right soprano, and Sandra Radvanovsky, who's been in this chair, is definitely the right soprano, then you do it, and you surround her with a superb cast, in every one of the major parts, including the king. You're the one who says to Medea, yes, you can stay one more day here, and then you have to go. <laughs> and what happens in that day yes. is this everything that you know about. So when they approach you to... Bad decision. Yes, Bad decision. on your part, on the king's part. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because your daughter is marrying, and she gets killed. Yes. And... Everybody but Jason and you. Oh, you you get killed too. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, very bloody in the last. Episode. I tried to save my my, my daughter. daughter. Yeah, uh, and you get killed too. Yeah. But Jason does not get killed. Almost. He's, he's <laughs> upset, but he doesn't get yes. killed. Yeah, almost. So it really is, you know, a murderous spree. But that makes great opera if you have great music that goes with it. Um, 
when they approached you to do this, what was your response? Obviously, you said yes, but what did you think about in terms of doing uh, a uh, new role, Creonte, uh, Medea, Cherubini, who's not a composer we see all that often? Um, I prepare Creonte. I, I start to, to read the, the, the score, my, my, my role. And uh, I, I was not convinced because for me, for my opinion, is um, a little bit uh, so strong, so dramatic. Uh, the rhythmus is, uh, maybe the phrase is uh, often violent mm -hmm. in the terzetto, for example, in the second act. Uh, I, I think it's not really for, for my voice. Mm -hmm. Because I, I imagine for Creonte uh, a voice uh, more dark, more uh, um, hard. Yeah. But um, when I start uh, the rehearsal in Metropolitan, and we speak with we also the production, David McVicker, also the conductor, Maestro Rizzi, uh, I, I start to, uh, to understand better the, the way for to give a character. And I think it was good. I think More it was, than good. Uh, yeah. I'm yeah. happy for, for, the, for you should be. that choice. Yeah. yeah. Um, in thinking about other roles that you've played, does anybody connect to Creonte, or is this really something different from everything you've done before? Is a is a character of uh, uh, the uh, to say the um, authoritative character. Mm -hmm. He's the king uh, with personality and yeah. uh, charisma. He does have that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In opera, we have uh, many roles for a bass mm -hmm. that uh, they, they need they need charisma. Yeah. Don Giovanni, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, also, Filippo. Ramfis, yeah. Ramfis yeah. is not Ramfis. For example, is not as a great role, but is very, very important. Very, the, the audience, uh, the audience is uh, colpita, no? Come they're uh, they're struck by, they're yeah. they're taken in by Ramfis. I yeah. think Creonte is similar yeah. the, the effect and the, and the final uh, because it is, it's true. It's not so long the role. Mm -hmm. But it's concentrate, like for example, for example, Maometto II, mm -hmm. Maometto II Rossini. by Rossini. Yeah. It starts the, at the end of the first act, and at, at, the, at the end of the, and the beginning, after the duo, the beginning of the second act disappear. Mm -hmm. It's re, really concentrate in, in small time, like Reonte. But but it's impressive. Yeah, this is in uh, the character is very interesting about that. When we think of Cherubini, we think of his uh, Stabat Mater. But when I ask other people to name other music by Cherubini, they don't come up with much. The only conductor I know who really focuses on Cherubini is Riccardo Muti, who seems to have found every single note that Cherubini ever wrote and likes to play it. And it's interesting, and I say that because if you want to learn more about Cherubini, as I encourage you to do, just look for recordings by Riccardo Muti. Um, today is the 17th, yes, of October, and this Saturday, the 22nd, the Met is streaming live in HD, Medea, all around the world, and unless you are fortunate enough to get a ticket for New York to see it live, because you really do want to see it live, I encourage people watching elsewhere to really go see this. It's... It's fabulous. It's just one of the most exciting things I've seen, not only at the Met, but anywhere in a very, very, very long time. And it's not just the lead. Sandra Radvanovsky is magnificent, but it's all of them, really. So, um, you know, you can see Traviata a lot. Traviata is a masterpiece. There are all these works we see a lot. You don't get to see Medea. The Met waited since 1883 to do it. So that's why I'm really very actively encouraging you to see it. And Carlo Rizzi will be in this chair on November 14th, and he's the conductor. So we can talk more about Medea then. 
But for now, um, Julian, if you would play number one, e ci spostiamo perché sì. c'è da sentire. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. 
Beautiful music. Eh? Beautiful music. <laughs> With uh, my friend uh, Gregory Kunde. So, purely coincidentally, because I programmed this music before what happened, I'm about to tell you, is Gregory Kunde will be here on May 15th, because I'm programming this, the winter and spring for us here, and he confirmed that. So there'll be three other dates in addition to that one next year. But... Um, Gregory Kundi is a tenor, of course, an American, with a very long career, and he's gone from singing very light music to much more dramatic music, almost completely in Italy and Spain, even though he's an American, and also England and other places. But um, he's barely known in our own country, which is very strange. Michele Pertuzzi is much better known in the United States than Gregory Kundi. You are <laughs> much better and admired, justifiably. Um, and what, I'm being shown something. Si uh, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Gregory, Gre Gregory follows. Gregory is follows, online. Yeah. Hello, yeah. Gregory Kundi. Okay. <laughs> Ciao, Greg. Gregory, he's in Bologna now singing Andrea Chenier. You should be in bed, Greg. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, the reason I picked this is because I was talking about Medea 
when I was asked what operas would you do at the Met, the two I always said were Medea and Rossini's William Tell, which they did beautifully a few years ago. Rossini, who I adore, um, the requirements for a singer are very different in Rossini than in Verdi, even though they were contemporary, somewhat contemporary. Um, I, in this particular section, the tenor repeats what he thinks repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. The bass listens a lot. And what I wanted to ask you is, listening in opera is a very hard job. And on stage. On stage. <laughs> I don't mean for the audience. For us, it's pleasure. <laughs> But on stage, it's one of the hardest things to do. And you did it incredibly well here because you reacted to what the character, what the tenor character was saying. And I've seen a lot of singers stand on the stage listening, and then when their time to sing, they react and wake up. You were with him every moment. It's, yeah, it's important for to build a, a character. Yeah. Because uh, it's not, uh, non è credibile. Not no, believable. It's not, not, it's not, it's not believable if a, if a singer stay like this all the time when the others, when the others uh, sing in, in this yeah. moment. Uh, it's, it's, it's normal to have, uh, to keep the tension mm -hmm. because it, it, It's true when we sing, we keep the tension because it's, it's more easy to 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 have to have the tension in the moment we when when sing. But when don't sing, it's difficult to keep the tension. Mm -hmm. This is the moment of uh, maybe you you know uh, the the mad scene in Lucia di Lammermoor yes. is very long, and Raimondo Raimondo is still on stage all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes we. <laughs> <laughs> But not, it's not possible. <laughs> Julian, set up number nine, by the way. Um, when I worked at the Met in the 80s, we did a very famous production of Lucia with Joan Sutherland and Alfredo Krauss. Mm. And it was filmed, and you could see it on video, and it's just. It's an extraordinary night of singing and acting and performing. But, um, all right, I'm telling stories out of school. There was a member of the chorus union who was very powerful and so powerful that she didn't have to sing. She was in the chorus, but she could sit on the stage and not sing. And when you look at the mad scene from Sutherland's Lucia, you really see two people on the stage. You see... Sutherland singing, running, going crazy, falling over. And you see the chorus member like this. Like, when is she going to be done with this so I can go home? <laughs> and this kind of thing would never be allowed nowadays, but we're talking 40 years ago, when a member could have such power that she would be allowed to sit all the way down front She was basically here, and Sutherland was there, and Sutherland was running around in the chorus member. <laughs> But I know what you're saying about singers who they have to remain engaged. So, Julian, play number nine. This is just audio. Ah, yeah. Dalle stanze dove Lucia Sorrettura, 
So, Julian, set up number six, please. Lucia, Lucia. Lucia. So, since you mentioned Lucia, I thought I would play something from it. I listened to this about a week ago when I was selecting the music for tonight. So, I listened again now. It was very slow. Is it always that slow? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. It was quite I slow. Yeah. I don't know why. Maybe. It was in Bulgaria. And I, I was young. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no... It, it's interesting because, uh, for example, Donizetti used the tonality here yeah. in, in this moment uh, for to keep the tension because it's, mi it's a E major. Mm -hmm. It's a tonality that I, I think it don't exist another area for bass 
yeah. in, in E major because the in the tonality E major is rich of tension. Uh, the tradition in the past, uh, this area was uh, an, half, uh, um, an half tone lower. lower. Yeah. But it's not the same thing because it's more easy maybe to sing. Mm -hmm. But the color is very, very different. Yeah. Uh, Donizetti was very, very, um, um, used very attention, very attention for the tonality. Mm -hmm. It's important in Donizetti to yeah. respect the, the original the key. And do many conductors and companies not respect the tonality of Donizetti? If, if for example, a singer thinks she sounds better in a different key? Uh, I, Yes, in, in Donizetti, sometimes the, the, the last scene of the tenor in Lucia yeah. is uh, a, 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 town, a town, uh, half, ta half tone lower. Yeah. lower. Uh, because is the phrase, ah, bella alma innamorata, is so, so high for, mm -hmm. for, uh, for the tenor. But, Except uh, Alfredo Kraus. <laughs> Alfredo <laughs> Kraus. <laughs> <laughs> or, or also Luciano in Luciano the, second, the young, yeah. young Luciano yeah. was. Yeah. was uh, uh, great. Um, Donizetti uh, don't want don't want to 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 give her music down. Yeah. Uh, in the letter, in the letter, is, uh, he, he write uh, mm -hmm. that is not possible because uh, not in, in in a letter. I think uh, about favorita. The first aria, una vergine, un angelo. Did he? He 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 wrote. Uh, is better to change the note, but not to to go down in the tonality. Hmm. We're mentioning this in part, and I'm fascinated by it because in the 19th century, but also later, but especially in the 19th century, there was known something as performance practice. In other words, if a diva felt she sounded better in a different key, she instructed her conductor that she was going to be singing it tonight in that key. And if Donizetti was not there to say, no, you have to sing it the way I wrote it, that's what happened. And then with the arrival of recordings in the early 20th century, where we started documenting these performances, we came to think that this is how they are supposed to be sung. And sometimes they were, of course, but very often you would have the individual singer adjust the key, adjust cadenzas, adjust all kinds of things to their liking. So there's a whole school now of musicologists, including one you've met on the stage, Francesco Izzo, who are going back and studying the intentions of the composers and trying to restore in what they call a critical edition the music come scritto as intended by the composer originally. And Michele brings up a really important point is that these were the dramatists, not just the people who wrote the libretti, but the, the composers were the dramatists, and they knew what they were expressing better than anyone who would come along and say, no, maestro would be better in a different key. You think so? Uh, yes, the definition is uh, teatro in musica. Yeah. But Theater, the acting music, yeah. is important. Yeah. With music. Yeah. Uh, the acting may be borns from the music, mm -hmm. but it's, it's a marriage, yeah. absolutely. So, Julian, play number six, and I, I want to pick up on what Michele just said. Vespri. Vespri. But in this case, it is only with piano. And therefore... Because the orchestra was in strike. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, true. Sicily. Um, but... <laughs> it's true. But I mention it because what we have here, it, with a very fine artist, taking the entire role of the performance and everything, and not condensing it, but really finding the essence of the aria, the character, and the moment in the opera Vespi Siciliani, and making it work magnificently well, but without the scenery and without everything around it, and not even an orchestra, just a piano. And I bring this to you as our last piece for the night, because I want you really to understand artistry at its highest level. So, Julian, if you please.
Area, but uh, it's important here in this moment to to see to see the the, the procida the Palermo Sea Palermo. So this is important is, to have inside Cicciani. you the image. It's set in 1282 in Palermo, 
and Michele was singing in Palermo at the Teatro Massimo in Palermo without an orchestra, as he described. And therefore, what I love, apart from the singing, of course, is the way he created all of that for the audience without scenery, costumes, lighting. Without, this is artistry. And not every opera singer is an artist. I wanted an artist to restart our series, Adventures in Italian Opera. And I'm very grateful, Michele Pertuzzi, that it was you who did it. So please thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Abbiamo passato l'esame. <ride> perché io, perché sì, io sì. in inglese so, so ordinare una bistecca, ma fanno una differenza. Anche una cosa ho letto.